Britain is home to some of the most iconic dishes in the world. Fire! From fish and chips to steam pudding, pie and mash to roast beef in Yorkshire's. My monster of the deep. Our national favourites have been hundreds of years in the making, and I want to reveal the untold stories behind them. Up. How roast beef fueled the building of an empire, and fish and chips helped save us in the war. To the great pudding robbery of 1718. I want to find out why they're so deeply rooted in our culture. So who's up first? Yeah! I'll be hopping into my time machine to explore their secret histories. This looks wrong. Looking for inspiration to create an epic culinary salute. HMS Chippy. Now I'm turning my attention to the roast beef dinner. I'll uncover the history of our national dish. Now there's a couple of recipes here that for me are just Crazy. Try and super-age beef with mould. It's being able to smell what I can smell. I want roast beef. Attempt to make a massive Yorkshire pudding in a giant oven before serving up the ultimate roast beef dinner to the farmers and butchers who make it all possible. Now it's time for the roast. <laughs> Every Sunday up and down the country, families gather, others are turned on, and the nation gets ready to sit down for a traditional roast dinner. It's all like to come round to mine and Dave's one time for Sunday dinner. Oh, nice one. Mum can cook there, be a nice change for me. Oh, yeah. With four out of five households enjoying a weekly roast, it's a dish at the very heart of British family life. It's one of the few times of the week where everyone can get together. All sharing and something, I think it's really nice. I think it's the most British you can get. It's clear the Sunday roast is a dish we've really taken to our hearts. And I want to celebrate the king of them all, roast beef with all the trimmings. But when did this much loved meal come together? It was during the Victorian period when the roast beef dinner as we know it today started to emerge. You've got the roast beef, the roast potatoes, there would have been some other veg, whether it was carrots or leeks or whatever, and um, a pudding. It's a Yorkshire pudding. But Yorkshires weren't the only pudding served alongside roast beef. The Victorians were also partial to a side of plum pudding. The closest thing to plum pudding that we know today is basically Christmas pudding. So it might seem a bit weird, you're having a roast beef with Christmas pudding, and it was. It was a sweet pudding with, made with uh, suet and dried fruit. And it was the Victorians who started the tradition of the Sunday roast dinner with all the trimmings. For the growing middle classes, sitting down to a Sunday lunch was a way of demonstrating their new wealth and social standing. Off they go off to church and then come back after church and gather around the table to share in this whole kind of roast beef dinner. And that was where the whole ritual of, of the man carving and putting on your Sunday best came from. The Victorians might have been the first generation to serve roast beef with Yorkshire pudding, but Britain's love affair with roasting meat goes back a thousand years. So to understand just why we love roast so much, I need to travel back to the late medieval period. It was then that we as a nation became known throughout Europe for our amazing roast meats. Any animal was up for grabs. Swans, herons, porpoises, even peacocks. And the more elaborately they were served, the better. Food at top level played so much more of a theatrical role. It was designed to impress and entertain and shock, surprise. All of these things rolled into one. Roasts played their part in the most sumptuous feasts. In 1520, Henry VIII and the French King Francis I staged an elaborate two-week party where each king tried to outshine the other with magnificent banquets and succulent roasts. I love the idea of doing something spectacular and surprising, inspired by an ancient recipe for a roast. And now there's a couple of recipes here that, for me, are just crazy and could be quite exciting and weird at the same time. And one of them I've been dying to try out for years, 
It doesn't involve beef, but combines two completely different types of meat into what today would be considered a pretty unusual offering. Chicken is dressed up like a knight, roasted and sitting on a pig, and it's conquered the piglets. Imagine if you were sitting there and your host brought that out. What would your reaction be like? That would be amazing. So I'm heading back in time to see if this recipe, called the Edible Knight, can inspire a bold approach to my own roast dinner. I've come to the Tower of London, where medieval monarchs dined on all kinds of astonishing meats. And the most flamboyant way of roasting was the spit roast. You got an ATM? Uh, ATM. <laughs> spit roasting is the slow turning of meat over an open fire, basting it with its own juices. It's a technique that us Brits perfected, earning ourselves a reputation as master roasters. For my edible night, I need a spit roasted pig, a spit roasted chicken, some medieval accessories, and expert advice from food historian Richard Fitch. So this would have been a real centerpiece, so it's the dish to so. really impress. When you visit someone of nobility, everything you see tells you how wealthy they are compared to you. The edible night recipe was the equivalent of medieval bling, a bit of spit roast theater, where a chicken in shining armor rides a pig into battle. <laughs> it just looks, <laughs> looks wrong. Got it. Got it. Helmet. Just very, very, very strange. Look at that. Sunday roasts are never going to be the same. <laughs> no prizes for the trumpet playing Herald. But how will 21st century diners react to the theatrical spectacle of the edible night roast dinner? Everybody. Don't think I'd see many chickens riding a pig. <laughs> I'd say a pretty flamboyant. <laughs> hey, hey. I thought it was very medieval, like something you'd see like back in the day. It's a bit barbaric. I love doing that. I've wanted to make that recipe for several years now, to be able to do it, to see it, and then see the reaction of people's faces. I right, that might have been from 1400, but I don't believe we've changed. I think we still have that excitement in us. And so for my roast dinner, I have to somehow capture that theatre in my finale. Next, I create a spit roast franking joint of my very own. This effectively is going to be the glue that's going to allow me to piece all these pieces of meat together and make them look like a giant rib, I think. And discover how beef helped us win the Battle of Trafalgar. I've tested it out myself. And? <laughs> <laughs> if there's one dish that's British to the very core, it's roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. I'm delving into its hidden history to find out why we love it so much, and I'm hoping it'll inspire my own ultimate roast beef dinner. Oh, beef. The sort of food that really rings a bell. By the 18th century, beef had become the most fashionable meat, and eating it was a symbol of wealth. As the size of the herds of cattle grew in Britain, so did our appetite for eating beef. It was considered a real sign of sort of strength, and in fact, patriotism. Beef was the food that fueled our troops, and by the Napoleonic Wars, it was even being used to recruit men into the British Navy. I want to find a recipe from this golden age of beef that will give me inspiration for my own ultimate roast beef dinner. So, I'm going back to Georgian Britain. 1805, eve of the Battle of Trafalgar. On his flagship HMS Victory, Admiral Lord Nelson makes ready for a battle that'll change the course of history. I'm here to discover how British beef helped Lord Nelson beat the French, and to see if his battle-winning recipe can spark an idea for my own roast beef dinner. Showing me the ropes is historian Andrew Baines. 
We're sat in the day cabin of HMS Victory, the Admiral's day cabin, and this is Nelson's breakfast That's table. amazing. I imagine Nelson would have been a man who loved his roast beef. Mm -hmm. But just how important was it to the Royal Navy? Well, for these guys, it's hugely important. They get about four pounds of beef a week, so it's a big part of the diet for everyone on board. Life in the British Navy was no joke. Men were away at sea for months, sometimes years, eating and sleeping in cramped conditions below decks. Recruiting sailors wasn't easy. When you're talking about joining the Navy, certainly one of the considerations is going to be they get a good diet by any standards of the day. With only one stove on board, there was no way to roast beef for the whole crew. The next best thing was a stew called lobscouse, made of potatoes and beef that had been cured in salt and stored in brine to keep it from rotting. Right, so I'm now going to attempt to make lobscouse, which could have been Nelson's dinner, supper, before the Battle of Trafalgar. I'm using salted beef. The beef's been brined. It's been heavily packed in salt, as you can see here. Salted brined beef could be kept on board ship for months. So I've washed this off, popped it into a pan with some diced potatoes. I'm adding some dried peas and some fried onions. This is a big staple. Biscuit. And it is just flour and water. There is a theory that this also provided much needed roughage to aid the, um, the system. Top it up with liquid and simmer. Rubs up! Two hours later, I'm testing my salt beef lobscouse on some willing members of the public and the current captain and crew of HMS Victory. Before you test this out on us, Hesson, have you tested it out on anybody else? I've tested it out on myself. And? <laughs> yeah. I think you should see what you think. Tough as you'd expect it to be, yeah. but it's pretty edible, actually. First taste is very nice, yeah. It's, These are good. It would do the job. Do you reckon you guys could have got one over the French with with this in your stomachs? Oh, yeah. 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 We've been there. Lobscouse may have been a bit tough, but there's definitely something in the flavour of this salty stew that's worth exploring. So that salt beef that they used to serve on HMS Victory to kind of motivate the, the, the sailors, it's given me an idea. I want to put my beef in a brine. I'm taking a short rib and I'm going to brine it. Brining is basically soaking meat in a salt water solution to help the meat taste more juicy when it's cooked. There's also another benefit to brining. The meat will draw in all the aromas from the flavours that are put into the brine. I flavoured my brine with herbs and garlic and soaked the beef for four hours, and then it's ready for roasting. I also want this roast to be inspired by the bold combination of meats in the Edible Night recipe. So, I'm creating my very own Franken joint bringing together some unusual and exciting cuts of beef. So, I've decided to go for tongue from here, cheek comes from here, not here. Then we've got the blade, which is kind of from around here, and then the short rib. And what I love about these cuts of meat is that there's a lot more connective tissue, and that means they have to be cooked for longer, they need more care, and they all need to be cooked in slightly different ways. But once you get it right, they give you fantastic juicy texture and you have more flavour. My ultimate roast beef dinner also needs to include many people's favourite cut of beef, the fillet, but it's not mine. The thing with the fillet is very, very tender, but it's bland. So from a chef's point of view, it's a pretty dull cut of meat. However, I've heard of some mad guys in a lab in Switzerland doing some crazy stuff with fillet that might just give me the flavour that I'm looking for. All beef is aged. Now, this is a natural process during which the proteins in the meat break down, making it more tender and flavoursome. But in this laboratory in Switzerland, two biotech entrepreneurs have found a way to super-age beef I'm told the results are amazing. So what I've come to see the guys who are creating, apparently, incredible beef with mould. 
So Lucas, what is it you do here? So what we do is producing meat in combination with microorganisms, actually a mold. And we do that to... To make moldy meat? Yes, right. We make it more tender and tastier with the mold. That's the goal, actually. Stored in vats of liquid nitrogen at minus 197 degrees centigrade lies a secret to Lucas Oxlin's remarkable discovery. High-tech mold. Mold could be the key to giving my fillet of beef an incredible flavor. It's deep down in there. <laughs> Can't really see anything. <laughs> <laughs> in there, there are the tubes where actually the mold is stored. This mold will tenderize beef, meat, and develop flavor. That's bad, isn't it? The mold is cultivated in a nutrient-rich liquid, like a protein shake. Then it's added to the beef where it goes to work, breaking down the proteins and tenderizing the meat. It's taking what already happens to aging meat, but then turbocharging it. Yes. Down we go to the inner sanctum, to a meat locker full of mold-aged meat, where it's time to find out if this fillet of beef really is as good as I'm told. Smell that. It's blue cheese, it's nutty. There's a grassiness as well to it. It's just really kind of... I love it. It's amazing, because if you'd never heard of this and you came in here and you looked at that, you'd run a mile, wouldn't you? being able to smell what I can smell. And that smell is all oh, I want roast beef. I want roast beef, I want roast beef. I want, I want roast beef. Once the super mold's been trimmed off and the fillet's been cooked, it's ready for me to taste to see if the mold really does improve the flavor. That's fantastic. Mm. The nuttiness. Cheesiness, yeah. grassiness, like farmyard, but in a really great way. I never thought I'd be saying this, but mould might just have the key to help me make my great roast dinner. I want to turn my cuts of beef into a joint that will look just like a classic rib roast. Each cut cooked to perfection, fused into one big franken joint and finished off on the spit for that flame grilled flavour. There's a short rib. This one is blade. I've got some tongue here. That's an ox cheek, that's a whole cheek. And this one here, this is the Swiss mouldy beef. To stick them together, I've made a roast chicken puree stuffing called a farce. This effectively is going to be the glue that's going to allow me to piece all these pieces of meat together and make them look like a giant rib, I think. You take the blade and just butterfly cut it, which means not cutting it all the way through. So give myself a layer of beef farce. Then some slices of cheek on top, and then more stuffing. Then it's the fillet. This is going to be the eye of the, of the rib. Mold-aged fillet in position, another layer of glue. And now I'm going to put some of this tongue on top of the fillet. Finally, the short ribs and a layer of fat that will crisp up nicely on the spit roast. And then what we need to do is then wrap the whole thing up. So now it's four hours in the fridge to set the glue and then the joint is ready for the spit roast. So here it is, the centerpiece for my roast beef dinner. And I've got an idea to put the extraordinary aroma of that mold-aged fillet in a beefy cocktail. And it's called Bullshot. And it's basically beef consomme, tomato juice and vodka. But to really give it that beefy character, I'm adding something from one of these. It's called a cloud pourer. There's a bit of dry ice there. The liquid is an extraction of that Swiss mold-aged beef. And it smells exactly like that beef aging. So there's cut grass, nutty, blue cheese characteristic to it. So watch what happens when I tip this upside down, I literally pour a cloud in my cocktail. So this way, when you have a sip, 
you get the smell of the beef, and then you get the taste of the ball shot. Cheers. With all the beef sorted for my ultimate roast dinner, now I need to find a place to serve it and find the best way to spit roast my franking joint. So I've called in my design team, Giles and David. Here's my idea. We're celebrating beef, maybe walk in with a beef on the spit um, with a whole little group of kind of military drummers celebrating the whole arrival of this amazing piece of meat. And I was thinking, I get this big metal beast like a proper ball, we can blow nitrogen out of his nostrils. Or something, you went into a field and saw that looking at you, you'd be a bit scared. Right, I'm a bit scared already. So it's like a giant spit roast? Yes, giant spit roast animal, exactly. And then we put the beef in there, so then we need a computer attached to the meat so we can put all the pros in, so we can measure the temperature. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> we need to serve it in a castle. Back to castle? <laughs> no. Real castle. No, a real castle. We need a real castle. A castle with a drawbridge. So it's a big, sort of British, castle y, beefy celebration experience. Yeah. Cracky, yeah. I can see it. Next, a culinary emergency as I try to make the mother of all Yorkshire puddings. I don't know about Yorkshire pudding, but I might be served up for Sunday lunch and my vision for a breathtaking spit roast comes to life. Wow. I think you've surpassed yourselves. <laughs> I'm delving into the hidden history of British roast beef and Yorkshire pudding to find inspiration for a 21st century culinary salute. While my design team work around the clock to bring to life my idea for a breathtaking ball-shaped spit roast, I'm turning my attention to the trimmings. And top of the list is Yorkshire pudding. What's your idea of a perfect Yorkshire pudding? Nice and big, homemade, just right for dunking. Crispy <laughs> all the way. And the bigger, the better. Yorkshire puddings used to be called dripping puddings, and they've been around for centuries, made with the batter cooked in the juices of the roasted meat. Traditionally, they were large enough to share. Reputedly, the best dripping puddings were made in Yorkshire, and the name stuck. Golden brown, the perfect texture in the rise every time. Can you imagine anything better? <sighs> Aunt Bessie's Sunday best. The best you can get. Yorkshire puddings are such an important part of any roast beef dinner. I remember when I was a kid, the Yorkshire pudding seemed so huge. So I've got to make a massive Yorkshire pudding. And for that, I need a massive oven. <laughs> I've come to the Gatwick Fire Service, where firefighters train in massive fireboxes. Just the place to see how big I can go with my Yorkshire pud. For Yorkshire pudding, you need an oven that's going to be hot enough, 200 degrees plus, but perhaps you'll need your batter, you'll need some oil that's going to get nice and hot, and you'll need a Yorkshire pudding roasting tray. So, the biggest roasting tray I could find, not ideal, is a paella pan. And that's not the only challenge of cooking in an oven as big as this. The problem with this is it's not a knob to turn or press to change the temperature. If the oil's too hot, it will fry the whole outside of the batter too quickly, which will set it and it won't rise. OK, here goes. It's in with the batter. I'm using my classic recipe, and it's never failed me yet. The normal cooking time for a Yorkshire pud is 20 to 30 minutes. So now we wait. I don't know about Yorkshire pudding we're baking, but I might be served up for Sunday lunch. Only five minutes in, and things aren't working out quite the way I'd hoped. It's not going up because the size of the right angle. It's the wrong pan. Really. Wrong pan, wrong heat. It's totally out of control. 20 minutes in, I can hardly bear to look. My giant Yorkshire pudding is a sloppy, uncooked mess. It looks more like a giant pancake. <laughs> Delicately infused with a hint of smoke. 
it was always going to be a challenge because I've got a pan where the sides weren't really the right shape. The batter oil ratio was a total stab in the dark. I've got an oven without a controller. <laughs> the cardinal sin making Yorkshire puddings opening the oven door. It's a total disaster and I'm back to square one. I can't serve roast beef without a Yorkshire. So I've gathered my chefs to see just how big we can go using a regular kitchen oven. It's all about the ratio of the, the base to the crust. And if it's too big, you get too much base and not enough crust. So the idea is we're going to make a family size Yorkshire pudding. That's more like it. Golden and crispy and risen round the edges. Yeah, so that's what we think is the optimum size for a table of six, eight people. A nice, crispy, crispy side. Perfect for tearing off and eating. I've got my Yorkshires to serve with my beef. Now I need to tackle the other elements of my roast dinner. Most of us wouldn't dream of tucking into our roast beef dinner without a dab of mustard on the side. I'm afraid there's been a slight hitch, sir. Oh! I neglected to pack the mustard. No more tart. When did we begin our love affair with this fiery yellow condiment? I've come to Coleman's in Norwich, where the mass production of English mustard began. Hi! And where 19 million tins and jars roll off the production line every year. I'm here to meet condiment expert Robin Weir and innovation manager Kezia Burton Ward. First, a little lesson in mustard making. Now, come on, you're going to work at this. They've got me grinding mustard seeds. So, if I taste that now, what? what... It'll taste some mustard. We've been eating coarse grain mustard since the 1600s, but the condiment that we know and love today was created in the 18th century when an Englishwoman, Mrs. Clements, hit upon a way to make it smooth. She had a factory which was kept locked and nobody was allowed in it. And for years, she made a fortune. I mean, even George I wrote about how good Mrs. Clements's mustard was. And all she was doing was using the same principle that they use when they grind wheat, <coughs> of sipping it. After her death, her secret method became known to Jeremiah Coleman, and the mass production of English mustard began. But what is it about mustard that makes it the perfect accompaniment to beef? Take a handful. <laughs> oh, yeah, there it comes. Yeah. Yeah. There she goes. Yeah. Oh. Mustard increases your rate of salivation about eight times. Um, so it enables you to, to taste things better. So the heat you get from mustard is not a taste. No, yeah, it gets yeah. the heat and pain receptors in your mouth and then obviously taste and smell are linked together and it's the same sort of thing as horseradish. So if you put a bit of mustard on a piece of meat, you can enhance the perception of, its, of the meat's juiciness as well. Right? Oh, yes. This is a bigger, yeah. a bigger effect. Oh. So mustard is a great food enhancer. I've decided to include it in my roast beef dinner in an unusual way as one of the key ingredients for a very special stock cube. I just love the idea that my guests can pimp their gravy. I'm making my very own OXO cube, a unique way for my guests to flavour their gravy. To begin with, I've got in this pan some shallots and garlic. To that, I'm going to add some reduced beef stock. I'm letting that infuse for 15 minutes, then straining it twice to extract the sweet juices and make it really smooth. Now for the flavour. First, the mustard, and then a really special ingredient. Here, I've got the most incredible extract of thyme. It's super, super concentrated. Only one drop needed, then in with a sheet of gelatine to make the mixture set. And here, I've got my stock cube mould. Pour in the mix, leave to set, and voila. So here are my beef stock cubes, but they're not quite finished yet. The finishing touch is wrapping them in silver leaf. Just like a classic stock cube. The difference with these stock cubes 
is that everything is edible. No need to unwrap. And my guests can choose from four classic flavours. Onion, thyme, red wine and garlic. Pop it in their own gravy boat, add the gravy base, stand back and watch the magic happen. So there is my very own Hoxo Cube customised gravy. The menu for my fantastical Sunday roast is almost complete. Now I'm turning my attention to the veg. Potatoes first, and with the spuds, it's all about the timing. The thing I always find amazing about a roast is that the whole thing is governed by the simple spud. Now, the potatoes will wait for no one. So when they're ready, they are ready, and everything else has to be ready and waiting. I've spent years perfecting the ultimate roast spud. The secret is lots of edges to get those crisp corners and parboil them until they almost fall apart. And that way, when you roast them, the oil runs into the cracks, giving them that beautiful glass-like crust. For me, these are the perfect roast potatoes. They just can't be bettered. So this is what I'll serve. There's one more chapter in the history of the Sunday roast that I want to explore. And it lies in our recent past. The 1970s and 80s saw the birth of a great British tradition, the Sunday carvery. With their all-you-can-eat roasts and help-yourself counters, carvers are still very much a part of our lives. So I want to theme my roast beef extravaganza around the British carvery and create a help-yourself vegetable counter with a twist. I've decided to make an entirely edible garden. And here's how I'm going to do it. So in here, I've got a carrot and swede puree. There's a celeriac puree. This is a mushroom duck cell, which is mushrooms that have been cooked with shallots. And here we've got a parsnip puree. That's the warm base of my garden. Now I'm going to make the topsoil, a toasted breadcrumb mix of rye flour, syrup, butter, mushrooms and fried onions. And there is my very healthy looking soil. Okay, so now I just need to sprinkling my soil. So now I need to plant my vegetables. For that real English garden look, I'm using steamed veg and edible flowers. In honour of the self-serve vegetable section of any great carvery, here is my pick-your-own fully edible vegetable garden. My menu is complete. Now, the big question is where do I cook and serve my roast beef extravaganza? At a secret location somewhere in Wales, a transformation is taking place. In a culinary salute to the grand theatrical feasts of medieval times, I'm transforming an ancient castle into a fantastical roast beef carvery. The success of my carvery depends on one thing, the specially made massive ball-shaped spit roast, untried and untested, and until this moment, unseen by me. Right. Oh, here he is. is that... This is it. This is it. I can't wait. Come on, then. Ta-da! Wow. I am gobsmacked. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Tell you what, guys, I think you've surpassed yourselves. Bloody hell. <laughs> I have never seen a spit roast anything like that anywhere in the world. For me, this bull captures all the medieval spectacle of those spit roasts of old. And in honour of that historical recipe, the edible knight, it's even got a chicken riding on its back. Now, with less than 24 hours to go, I need to get to grips with my extraordinary spit roast. This is the tail which turns the spit. The meat goes in here. It's coming in the fire. It's all in there. 
This was a little bit of danger because it's not the kind of thing you can do dry runs on. We've still got to pay really careful attention to the whole process because otherwise it, it could be ruined. I have to say, I'm, I, I, I feel quite emotional, actually. It's amazing. Next. My roast beef is ready to serve as I throw open the doors to my medieval castle carvery. Let the feast begin! Wowzers. Today, I open the doors to my fantastical roast beef carvery. My team are working flat out to pull together one of the most ambitious meals I've ever attempted. And I've spread special invitations among the hard-working farmers of Britain, the very people who bring us our Sunday roasts. Wow. Golden ticket. Present this ticket to Castle Cock for a very special carvery experience. Yeah. <laughs> In your wildest dreams, you cannot imagine the roast dinner extravaganza that awaits you. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Behind the scenes in my car park kitchen, it's a military operation to make sure everything arrives at the table piping hot and on time. If I don't get it right, I'll have a roast beef rebellion on my hands. I think he risks upsetting us if he tries to fiddle with our food too much. Roast potatoes have got to be on the menu. It's going to be like testicles or eyeballs or something <laughs> horrible or... I don't know. After months of planning, my roast beef carvery is finally opening for business. Set in an ancient castle, it's the perfect place to play tribute to an iconic, historic British dish. Oh, my God! Wow. That's the most amazing, amazing really magical castle. Just waiting for the dragon to turn up. <laughs> Inside my castle carvery, if all goes to plan, my guests will be dining in true medieval style on a spit roast Sunday lunch they'll never forget. Wow, this. Not what I was expecting when the doors opened at all. <laughs> First, there's a spectacular spectacular salute to the beef I'm about to roast, marched in with full military honours. It's amazing, you can hear the drums coming up the bridge and you're like, oh my god, it's coming, it's so exciting. It's so very British, I love it. <laughs> Welcome to my castle carvery. I want to celebrate the great British roast beef dinner, the dish that basically built Britain. So, let the feast begin! <laughs> the success of this great British roast depends on one thing, my 21st century take on a medieval spit roast. We've come up with what I think is the ultimate spit for roasting beef. It's amazing. It's a piece of art. I'm attaching my special rib, already cooked to perfection on the inside. Now I need to finish the outside by crisping it and browning it with fire. And then following with a burst of nitrogen to prevent the delicate meat on the inside from overheating. And I'm going to monitor all of this using heat probes connected to a laptop. There's the core probe, which control the, the temperature of the inner part of the meat. And there's the surface probes, which control the, the stuff just below the fat. And that's really critical that we don't let that get too hot. Yeah, it's not the standard Toby Carvery, is no, it? It's no, it's certainly upgrade from that. Something completely different that you wouldn't see anywhere else. The fire's roasting the outer fat of my joint nicely, but the probes tell me the meat inside's getting too hot. Now we need to then turn it and give it a little dose of nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen will make sure the beef doesn't overcook, while the outer layer of fat crisps up nicely. And it's coming out of the <laughs> Pretty impressive. 
take off. That is amazing. Looks like he's going to take off. <laughs> While the meat's roasting, behind the scenes in our kitchen, we've got an issue with the timing of the spuds. We've got a castle with this amazing animal. We've got computers and nitrogen and fire and edible gardens and everything. But this whole celebration revolves around one thing, the humble spud. And if these are ready and the meat's not, we've got a bit of a problem. Yeah, that looks good. Pack them up further. The roast potatoes need longer. But back at the carvery, my guests are having their first dip into my edible vegetable garden, where they can help themselves as many times as they like. What is that? This is fantastic. I just want to know what it all is. That looks amazing. Oh, look is this mm. What is it? That's lovely. Mm. Nice. Those two, those. Oh, that's nice. Inspired by the all-you-can-eat veg counters of the classic British carvery, this is a vegetable garden where nothing is what it seems. <laughs> it's like you just pulled it from the garden, you're expecting the dirt to sort of taste horrible, but it's all edible. It's really nice. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. I'm loving the soil just as much as the vegetables. On the spit roast, my franken joint of many cuts is ready for carving. The smell is fantastic. So is, I think it's now it's ready to take it off. The meat's not cooked right. That's the whole meal ruined, isn't it? Let's be honest. His reputation's on it. Oh, yeah. Is, yeah. Can technology, such as the laptop and the probes, ca can that make a good joint to roast beef? We're about to find out. The real key to this is when we slice through it. So I don't want to make any positive comment just yet in case I turn fate. And uh, all the work that's gone into this could all fall apart. In the next move. Yeah. We're going for it. We know we've got a really nice crust on this. You can smell it. Just to be, now we're going to make sure we've got, we've got that, that real juiciness. Quite intense up there. Looking yeah. at the, um, <laughs> yes. beginning to carve it now. I'll double look. look. Yeah. We've got the crust, the inside's nice and juicy. We've kept the even temperature gradient all the way through and all the work that we've done on getting those pieces of meat just, just right. We've done it. Better now it's time for the roast. <laughs> My medieval-inspired franken joint is served. Spit roast beef with extra crackling on top. <laughs> it looks absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. It's uh, perfectly done. It looks so yummy, smells delicious, and I can't wait to tuck in. Bang on schedule. My biggest headache, the spuds, are finally done. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the best bit. My joint of five cuts looks extraordinary, but how will my guests react to the taste of the mold-aged beef? It's just so strong in flavour. Very, very powerful. Yeah, it was really good. Right. Melts in your mouth. My beef is going down a treat, and I'm giving my guests their own customised hotso cubes with four flavours to choose from. You can just give it a boost of thyme or red wine or garlic or onion. Served with lashings of gravy base. Oh, wow! It's all disintegrating, the foil and everything. <laughs> Which is not foil. Gravy is so rich, so many flavours in it. It's so nice. It's the best gravy I've had, I think, so far. And here come my family-sized Yorkshire puddings. Absolutely <laughs> massive. Wow. Now look at the size of that. <laughs> 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 it's good. <laughs> it's delicious. <laughs> it's going really well. Really well. It's a bit tricky at first when we're looking at the, at the meat and the temperatures and thinking, God, is this going to work? But they are loving it. Reinventing a time on a dish was always going to be tricky. But it doesn't look like there's going to be any complaints around here. Okay, do you want to have that? Oh, oh shame. <laughs> Come on. This is amazing. Beautiful. Wouldn't mind another one of these. <laughs> My breathtaking roast beef extravaganza is almost done. But before I send my guests home, I'm giving them one last surprise. 
my cloud poured beef cocktail. To the beef! The beef! beef. It's the beef! It's the same colour as me cider, but they don't have taste different. <laughs> <laughs> I set out to unearth the historical roots of our love of roast beef, to draw inspiration from its fascinating past and reimagine a roast for the 21st century. It's just such a wonderful food experience, you know. Yeah. Um, probably even better than what I imagined, to be honest. Everything's so easy now with ready meals and things, so it's quite nice to see someone doing it properly. <laughs> it's just a once-in-a-lifetime Sunday roast experience, I think. We're never going to have it again. When I started out on my journey to celebrate the dish that built Britain, I thought, well, it's clear why it's done this. It's motivated navies. It's fueled armies. But having just left this castle, but that experience, I know why it's built Britain, just because it brings people together and it's going to continue to do that forever. Next time, guess who? I'm delving into one of Britain's greatest culinary achievements, the pudding. Oh, wow. I'll be sniffing out the ultimate pudding flavours. Some people think it smells of lovely parmesan cheese. Oh, oh sick. Bringing London to a standstill with a recipe from the past. Who's up first? Yeah! And whipping up an epic celebration of our proud pudding heritage. Pudding! <laughs> Heston's Great British Food moves to Monday at nine next week. And if you like Heston, but it's Gordon that makes your Yorkshire rise, he's doing some festive cooking on a Friday this week at eight. A delectable drama that has us all feeling rather sensual. The finale and special, special feature-length episode of Masters of Sex is next.